AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. There's something I haven't told you yet. I am blind. I am completely blind. I can't see my face in the mirror. I can't even see my hand in front of my face right now. And I certainly can't see any of you. Her name is Molly Burke, a petite 20-year-old inspiring motivational speaker. When she was four years old, her world started to darken. When I was in grade one, I started realizing that I was different than the other kids because I had a special teacher that sat beside me and was learning how to read with my fingers instead of my eyes. Doctors diagnosed her with retinitis pigmentosa, imposing words that describe a terrible retina disease that eventually causes permanent loss of vision. I think it was really hard for my family to watch me go through a grieving process that they had been through themselves when I was diagnosed with RP at four. I felt like I was my blindness. That was the most identifying feature of Molly. She's the blind girl. And it's hard to feel like all you are is a disability because it makes you feel like you're a walking, talking burden on everyone around you. At age 14, Molly lost all of her sight, but gained an inner gift, a gift she now shares with the world through public speaking. I couldn't see the faces of the girls who bullied me. I was alone in a forest. I couldn't see, I couldn't walk. They took my crutches, my backpack, and my dignity. But I found my voice, and my voice is strong. But this isn't the story of a brave young woman who grew a strong voice against bullying. This is a story of an inner battle to accept a devastating recent adversity. It was harder, in a sense, than losing my vision, than the bullying and the mental health because I lost the person or, or the animal that got me through all those things. Gypsy, a hefty, short-haired Labernese, Molly's soulmate and guide dog, suddenly died of cancer, devastating her. The year I lost my vision was also the first year that I was working with her. And to see the bond and the companionship when I felt like I had no one else that I could rely on or talk to. I had her. I knew that no dog would ever be as good as her. Nicolas Saint Pierre is the Director General at Mira, a nonprofit organization and unique guide dog training facility in Saint Madeleine, Quebec. They are specialists when it comes to matching guide dogs with handlers. Molly has handpicked Mira, putting her hope and future in their reputation. You have to start over again, and that's the part that people sometimes forget. They come back to get a dog, and they say, I want exactly what I had with my old dog. Well, that's impossible. Karen Winter, senior trainer and instructor at Mira. Her heart was closed because she still had a lot of strong love and compassion uh, for her other guide dog that passed away. And I went back to the kennel and received Gallop. I just cried and cried and cried for an entire morning. She wasn't there. And it just brought up all of that pain of losing her and I just wanted to give up and go home. A new friend in sight. Molly Burke is now fighting a second battle in an even darker place, the loss of her cherished guide dog, Gypsy. But before we can explore this story, we need to go back to the beginning for an understanding of who Molly Burke is and what her journey has been like. I am a full-time motivational speaker. I speak about 
Everything from bullying to mental health issues to leadership and overcoming adversity um, to large groups of audiences, small groups of audiences all over the world and I love my job. I'm very lucky to have it. As important as it is to speak out, silence can be powerful and silence can be loud. And I am here at the Mira Foundation in Quebec to get my second guide dog. Molly Burke is like any other 20-year-old girl. I love shopping and music and Starbucks and uh, hanging out with my friends and going for walks and doing anything else any other 20-year-old would do. My name is Neve Burke and I am Molly Burke's mom. My mom is, she's like that zen, we call her uh, Dalai Mama instead of Dalai Lama because she's, she's just that, always uh, able to whip out one of those inspirational lines at any moment. She was just like, go, 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 kick, 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 you know, that sort of kid. And then when they're born, it's like a dynamo, just go at it and, and just, you know, just going for her, her goals without really putting, there's not too much fear in there. It's just like, she has visions and she wants to go for them. My dad is someone who can always put a smile on your face by telling the cheesiest jokes uh, that you smile at simply because he thinks they're funnier than they are. I have an older brother named Brady. He's, uh, he's my inspiration. He's the person who inspires me to be the best person I can be because I look at him and I know he's pushing himself every day to be the best person he can be. And so I want to be like that too. My name is Peter Burke and I'm Molly's father. It, M Molly is an um, incredibly um, vibrant person. She's vivacious, um, she's very outgoing, she's very people oriented. Um, she uh, loves to talk. Um, uh, and she has got a remarkable ability to engage people. Growing up, my parents were incredible at helping me to be like any other kid and having the experiences that any other kid would have. Part of it came from some great advice we got from her uh, original doctor at Sick Kids, Dr. Eon, who sort of suggested, because we were very nervous when we first found out what was going on. You know, I guess typical parents, we just got very scared about what that meant for the future. And I think she gave us great advice, which was to, to let Molly be the judge of what she can and can't do. And we really took that to heart, mm -hmm. I think, in that yeah. we, just made us realize that, no, let's let her be the person who just sort of says, I'm no longer able to do this. Realizing, you know, thankfully and happily that when she hit the playground, she was going to go to the very top of the, you know, the, the, the bar section and swing her way across and just watching that, or she'd have an eye patch on, trying to make one eye stronger. And we'd be in this huge park with all the other kids and thinking that she can still see, you know, and. And, and she's just flying around the playground equipment like everything's fine. We wanted to give her the conference to really sort of stretch herself. When she kind of started realizing a little bit, around six, seven, that she was potentially going to lose her vision, we thought maybe around 40, or she just said, I want to try everything. And I think that would have been her anyway, way, but so we, we just had to put a plan of action in that meant that she could try everything while she had her vision. Um, so yeah, we just had great fun making sure she skied and, and uh, played basketball, which was terrifying. They threw me into skiing and horseback riding, acting classes, art classes. I was on a soccer team and basketball, tennis, everything you could imagine. My parents threw me into. She wanted to do everything. She was happier doing stuff. On that level, my life was like any other kid. They let me fall and scrape my knees if that's what I was gonna have to do. But normal kid or not, the challenges were starting to appear. She was starting to have social issues in that she couldn't keep up with the, the pack, especially in the playground when it's running around and playing tag or, you know, your friends disappear and you can't find them. And especially when you're very little and there's big kids in the playground, it was, uh, I think, very, very scary for her. I knew that I was a little bit different, um, and I learned how to say retinitis pigmentosa, and I learned how to describe it to people, but I didn't actually know 
how what I was saying would affect my life. Coming up on AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. It's hard to feel like all you are is a disability because it makes you feel like you're a walking, talking burden on everyone around you. Welcome back to AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. Molly Burke, a petite, 20-year-old inspiring motivational speaker is fighting a battle in a dark place after losing her Labernese guide dog and soulmate Gypsy to cancer. Molly's mother explains. We were actually grieving, you know, and, and keeping busy with Molly was really helping us too because it took our minds off it. Yeah, I went to sick kids a few more times than most kids would go. Um, and I had a cane, which wasn't really the norm. I think when Molly would have noticed us grieving was when she began grieving. And um, then we went through the grieving with her. So that was much more difficult, like much more difficult than um, our personal grieving. Um, and I'm sure she would have noticed it at that time for sure. As difficult as life was for Molly at the time, her high school years offered her no shelter. The bullying became very intense and I became very depressed and I stopped being okay with who I was. When I was being bullied, I had very low self-esteem. Um, I felt like I was my blindness. That was the most identifying feature of Molly. She's the blind girl. And it's hard to feel like all you are is a disability. Because it makes you feel like you're a walking, talking burden on everyone around you. My initial and immediate reaction is, is one of sadness um, to hear that she would define herself um, by her disability, not by her abilities. Um, and, you know, Neve, when Molly was younger and going through some tough times, Neve actually sheltered me from a lot of it because I think she knew that, um, you know, being sort of a male, I'm going to want to jump in and solve the problems. And a lot of these problems can't easily be solved. So Neve did a fantastic job of sort of probably sheltering me and bearing the burden of, of dealing with a lot of that. We really felt extremely powerless when she was in school and, you know, moments when she was being bullied, which were the worst, you know, when we, we really kind of weren't expecting that. We thought um, just the mere fact that she was blind might endear people to be a little bit more protective or supportive and that she would get through based on that. Um, we were kind of shocked ourselves that that wasn't the case. You know, I mean, there are many, many good people, but definitely difficulties with the children who were also going through their own issues. You know, so those grade eight years, grade nine are very tough. High school years uh, were very tough. She was certainly kind of going through a depressed period, but I think she was I think she had a lot of emotions. I think she was angry. Um, I think she felt um, that she just didn't fit anywhere, mm -hmm. that she wasn't connected to anything. Um, and I think increasingly, um, the risk of that, particularly in that period, was that sense of truly becoming isolated mm -hmm. and feeling like you're, that you are alone. Yeah. Um, and again, just going through those young teenage years, you're trying to break away naturally from your parents. And in a way, it became more of a challenge because we were there to try to support her more. And at the same time, she's pulling to break away. I had to go through a grieving process. So I had to realize that the Molly I pictured myself growing up to become maybe wasn't going to happen anymore. And I had to kind of let that part of myself go and figure out who this new Molly inside of me was and what she was going to do with her life. I think the biggest concern for me was isolation. Um, that, you know, blind people can get isolated. And it's, it's the one thing I was trying to avoid with her, that she get isolated because then everything gets worse. If there's, you know, interests and community and friends, family, then that can, that can help band-aid that. But she was getting increasingly isolated and that was, that was scary. We started doing a lot of reading, I guess a little bit more, spiritual or if you, if you want you know kind of the power of now of thinking in the now just trying to help her with her thinking trying to help her with 
thinking in a positive way because there's more strength in thinking positively than negatively. And as we were doing that with her, of course, we're learning. So we're all kind of learning together. My friends really didn't understand. In fact, I remember telling a group of my best friends what the doctors had said at SickKids once I was losing more vision. And they had said to me, well, at least you're not dying of cancer. And I realized that they really didn't get what I was going through. It did feel like a piece of me was dying. And I was literally watching it go. And they just didn't seem to get how much of an impact that was going to make on my life. When I was losing my vision and struggling with depression, I felt like my future was going nowhere, really. I could only at that point see the things that I couldn't do. I couldn't drive a car. I was never going to be a surgeon um, or fly an airplane. There was all these things I was never going to do or couldn't. During our interview with Neve Burke, a sudden rush of emotion overcomes her, halting the interview temporarily. What is the one thing you have always wanted to tell Molly that you've never told? Hmm. Hmm. Can you stop? Yeah. And I told her, I, I, I'm not leaving your side until you're better. And, you know, that's just what the plan is. I, I definitely was looking down from the time she was diagnosed going, oh dear, you know, what's going to happen? And the more I found out, 80% unemployment in, in the blind community, that was deeply concerning. Um, but at the same time, it kind of pushed me. I was glad to know those statistics because it made me work really super hard along with her to find out what her interests were and to work with those and to encourage her to to depend on herself to maybe have her own business in whatever she really was enjoying in life. Creating options for her for a future. So for example, um, when Molly was young she didn't actually like dogs. She was afraid of dogs. and. We thought that there might become a time where I should either need a guide dog or benefit from a guide dog. And we thought, let's get her comfortable with dogs. And we ended up getting a family pet just so she could be comfortable you know, with a dog. And that down the road sort of laid the foundation for her to be able to go and get, a, get her first guide dog. You know, equally, it was just always about creating opportunities that, so she could see a potential future and she'd have choice and options versus feel like you know that those kind of things were taken away from her. So it's almost like treating her like any other child, saying, the world is yours, go carve your path. My name is Karen Winter. I'm a senior trainer instructor here at La Fondation Mira, the Mira Foundation. Mira is unique because we're one of the only guide dog training centers that offers guide dogs to children under the age of 16. Mon nom est Nicolas Saint-Pierre. My name is Nicolas Saint-Pierre. I am the Assistant General Manager of the Mira Foundation. It was my father who decided to give the children guide dogs. You see, he used to see me with my dogs when I was seven or eight or ten years old. He saw the connection I had with my dogs, and he would say, it's impossible for a blind little boy or little girl not to have that same chemistry with a dog that my son had as an eight-year-old running through the woods with his golden retriever. That's where the idea came from. On rest. Et ça, rest. Our youngest uh, clients to receive guide dogs are 11 years of age. Of course, they have to be responsible and mature enough. The way Mira looked at it was, if you have the skills, if you're independent, if you're mature enough, and if you have the lifestyle, then why not, why not give you a dog? And I thought that was amazing. They get the support from their orientation and mobility instructors. They've followed, followed courses uh, using uh, white cane travel. Um, but uh, that's, it's really special to give a guide dog to a child of 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. Uh, it changes their life. <laughs> 
If I can improve someone's quality of life, say a person who may never have gone out before, starts to go out once every three days, perhaps taking a walk, which they never did before, well, I consider it a job well done. So my goal ever since I had found out about the Mira Foundation, when I was eight years old, was to get a dog at 13. That was all I wanted. And so that was kind of my motivating drive to use my cane, was knowing that if I had great O&M skills, that maybe Mira would train me with my first dog at 13. Coming up on AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. And then I became terrified when I found out that the first <laughs> step was basically for her to go to Montreal by herself to be assessed. Welcome back to AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. Molly Burke, an inspiring motivational speaker, is fighting a second battle in a dark place after losing her guide dog and soulmate Gypsy to cancer. We had time to prepare a little bit for what was ahead for Molly and, and kind of watching what was happening each time we went to appointments, things seemed to be progressing a lot quicker than they had thought. When I was losing my vision and struggling with depression, I felt like my future was going nowhere, really. When Molly was young, she didn't actually like dogs. She was afraid of dogs. And we thought that there might become a time where I should either need a guide dog or benefit from a guide dog. And we thought, let's get her comfortable with dogs. And we ended up getting a family pet. I came to the Mira Foundation because they were the only school that accepted people under 18 or 16. So every other school I looked at said, you must be at least 16 or 18 to get a dog. And then I became terrified when I found out that the first <laughs> step was basically for her to go to Montreal by herself to be assessed. And this was happening, I think it was around the March break. Yeah. And we essentially put her on a train here in Oakville by herself to go to Montreal. Um, and that was a little terrifying to think that my 13-year-old, you know, is getting on a, on, a, on a train by herself going to Montreal and she can't see. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Okay. En avant. Allez. Mira is unique because we're one of the only guide dog training centers that offers guide dogs to children under the age of 16. Um, a lot of other schools uh, worldwide, it, uh, the age limit is either 18 or maybe even 16 at this point in time. But our youngest uh, clients to receive guide dogs are 11 years of age. With children with pervasive developmental disorder, we first look at their family, whether the family has real motivation for introducing a dog into their lives. Because at the end of the day, it is a lot of stress. They already have a stressful life with their children and all the comings and goings of their daily routine. Then, to add a dog to their family, well, is it going to help them or is it going to take them further down? So, this is mostly what I look at. And sometimes, well, sometimes you have to think, we are here to help people. So, sometimes they don't necessarily have the potential. N no, not the potential. I don't like the word potential. Uh, rather, the profile of people we can really help or for whom a dog is going to make a difference. And sometimes the dog can really make a difference. It also depends on people's will to get involved with their dogs. And I was so nervous because I knew that if I didn't pass the O&M evaluation, if hanging around the dormitories, they didn't feel I was mature or independent, that they weren't going to give me a dog. So. I was so nervous, I tried to be on my best behavior, to do everything right, and that moment after the few days that I had spent here where they said, we're welcoming you back for July, it was one of the most exciting things I've heard. The moment was going to happen that she might actually get this dog and were we ready for her to have a dog? And you know, and people had started saying, you know, it's a lot of work to have a dog. Are you sure you want your daughter to have a dog? And, you know, at that point, it didn't feel like it was our choice because we've been kind of going along with her dream of having a dog. And it didn't feel like it would have been too kind to now jump in and say, we've rethought this. We don't think you should get this dog. You know, I think that would have been very difficult. So 
now we were facing the reality that she might actually go off and get the dog. So, 13 is a very young age to get a guide dog. I received Gypsy in July of 2007. I would say Molly probably just got Gypsy at the right time going through teenage years because I'm not so sure that Molly would have gotten through it without Gypsy. It's, it, it's up for grabs, I, I just don't know. The person who surprised me the most through this period with the support they gave me was actually not a person at all. It was my guide dog, Gypsy. The year I lost my vision was also the first year that I was working with her. And to see the bond and the companionship when I felt like I had no one else that I could rely on or talk to, I had her. Molly's outlook, really. Um, Gypsy was, you know, a, a magical change in her life. I think she gave her um, companionship and a best friend. Uh, she was never alone. Um, you know, I never grew up with dogs. When we got our first um, pet, it made me realize what having a, a dog in the house, fam, you know, animal in the house, changes the feel of the home. You're never alone. They're happy to see you. And I think that connection with with a guide dog and and, and you know, the owner is so much deeper. They bonded. They seem to have very kind of similar personalities. Gypsy was kind of like a little bit teenagey, girly. They, you know, they a little bit look at me and. <laughs> Gypsy was something else. She had many nicknames: Princess, Diva Dog, just to name a few. So you probably understand what kind of girl she was. And the funny part about Gypsy was that. She was a little much for me. At 13, I was even smaller than I am now. Um, and I was still a little bit fearful of dogs. And I think it, that was a transformative, I think, experience mm -hmm. for Molly. In the household itself, um, you know, Gypsy was another big personality like Molly. I mean, when she first came in, mm -hmm. she was very quiet and, and, mm. and, and retiring. Yeah. But as she came out of her shell, it was just like, great, now we have two big personalities <laughs> in the house. And they brought out this 65 pound bundle of two and a half year old energy. And it was overwhelming. And I tried these other dogs who were calm and quiet and small. And I thought, oh, they're nice. And uh, I didn't realize that I needed the spunk in my life. <laughs> I needed the, the gypsy energy around me. It was just the, the perfect match for, for Molly. So she, she just made Molly laugh and kept her, gave her her best friend. And um, it, it was just wonderful. And, and it, it made, when, when she was walking down the road, everything was easier. She could walk fast. She, it made her, gave her way more to talk about with her friends and, and with family and with everybody. And her whole, whole, whole world just opened up. And when we were doing our kennel walks for the first few days of training, I would walk with all these dogs and they would walk me perfectly through the obstacle courses. I would walk with Gypsy, she'd walk me perfectly through the obstacle courses. And then, you know, we'd, we'd change dogs around. Gypsy would walk with somebody else and she'd walk them however far down the obstacle course until she saw me and then she'd walk them to me and sit down. And at that moment, the trainers knew and I knew that even if Gypsy maybe wasn't my first choice, I was her first choice. And Diva Dog wasn't gonna work for anyone else. The downside of having the dog that young was that it, she had no idea really how much work it was going to be. And that also was a drain on her energy at a time when she was going through such a decline in her vision and then trying to deal with entering teenage years and all the complications of that. Gypsy was my baby girl. She was my firstborn child. That's how I used to refer to her. Um, she was a ton of work and that's what people have to be prepared for. It's not all fun and games when you get a guide dog. It is a lot of work. But that work is so worth it because in return, they give you confidence and independence. They give you a friend. And Gypsy 
gave me all of those things and so much more. It just gave Molly um, that opportunity to, to love somebody who was going to unconditionally love her back. Um, maybe even with family at times, like you say, it was difficult, you know, she felt like a burden, but with Gypsy, she didn't have those feelings. It was just a, you know, a guaranteed relationship where she was unconditionally loved no matter what. And um, it meant that she had somebody to take care of and, and get herself out of herself and get up in the morning and feed her dog and walk her dog and worry about the dog if the dog was sick and, you know, be happy when the dog was better, you know, all those great things that happen with dogs. Gypsy and I definitely relied on each other. Uh, I relied on her to keep me safe and she relied on me to feed her. Um, we both had to trust each other that we were going to complete those tasks. Um, and, and we always did because we loved each other. And I think Gypsy would have done anything for me just like I would have done anything for her. Because the relationship of a guide dog handler and their dog is so much more than the relationship of a family and a family pet. Uh, and people don't really understand what it's like until you are that person and you have that dog. Coming up on AMI Originals presents a new friend in sight. Just everything that Molly was building up to being, and um, just she she shut down. She, it was it was quite scary. Welcome back to AMI Originals presents a new friend in sight. When a young child has a guide dog and they're going to school, people accept the person a lot more. They see the dog and, wow, hey, what's your dog's name? Want to come out with me after school? Uh, Want to have lunch with me? They make friends. They're accepted into society. And not only that, having a guide dog with them 24-7, uh, it's, it's not only is it companionship, but it's also uh, it boosts their confidence and self-esteem. When I had Gypsy, I felt much more approachable. I think something you hear a lot of cane users that have transitioned to guide dog users say is, nobody ever came up and asked me how old my cane was or if they could pet it. But when you have a dog, it opens that whole social world where people are approaching you. And it kind of gives them a nice icebreaker. What's your dog's name? What do they do? Why are they in the mall? It, it allows them to feel comfortable with bringing up the subject of what a lot of people always feel is like the elephant in the room, the disability. And it, for me, and I know for a lot of my fellow guide dog handlers, allowed us to feel more open. And it certainly allowed me to make connections with people on a deeper level and to meet people that I don't think I ever would have met without her. Then, with very little warning, everything changed. Just about everything. You know, she just, just everything that Molly was building up to being and um, just she, she shut down. She, it, was, it was quite scary. It was probably like going back to when she was 12, 13. The sudden and unexpected death of Gypsy, Molly's guide dog and soulmate of seven years, has turned Molly's world upside down. I think maybe she revisited the time before she had the dog, and and for sure, and I, I yeah, she just seemed to start disappearing. All the the qualities that she'd developed while having the dog were now going away. You you could see that she was actually kind of withdrawing. Um, she was again getting a little more isolated. Um, there was certainly no sense of joy um, in her. And, and I mean, she was clearly deeply grieving Gypsy, but I think it was more than that. I think it was that sense of that I'm not as independent as I was without the dog. Um, I'm back to being more needy, needing more assistance. Uh, and I don't think she liked that feeling, having grown accustomed to having freedom with the dog mm -hmm. and, and 
just the ability to interact with people more freely with it. I think she really sort of felt that the, becoming increasingly isolated again. She was definitely a shadow of the former person that we knew and know well, and um, she just became very, very obsessive about dogs and just very unlike herself because she, she normally had so many interests and so many, she, she was definitely grieving and it was, it was quite concerning. It's probably the hardest thing I've been through. It was harder in a sense than losing my vision, than the bullying and the mental health because I lost the person or, or the animal that got me through all those things. And it kind of felt like an ending to all of the firsts that I experienced with her. With Gypsy, I experienced my first love and my first heartbreak. I graduated high school and went to prom with her as my beautiful date. I moved out on my own to an apartment in Toronto and I got my first full-time job. I traveled the world. I spoke on stages in front of 20,000 people with her by my side. I had a lot of firsts with her. And when I lost her, it felt like all of those things ended. Coming up on AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. For a long time, it scared me how amazing Gypsy was because I knew that no dog would ever be as good as her. Welcome back to AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. Molly Burke, a petite 20-year-old inspiring motivational speaker, is fighting a battle in a dark place after losing her Labernese guide dog and soulmate Gypsy to cancer. When I had Gypsy, I felt much more approachable. I think something you hear a lot of cane users that have transitioned to guide dog users say is, nobody ever came up and asked me how old my cane was or if they could pet it. When a young child has a guide dog and they're going to school, people accept the person a lot more. It's probably the hardest thing I've been through. It was harder, in a sense, than losing my vision, than the bullying and the mental health, because I lost the person or, or the animal that got me through all those things. She was definitely a shadow of the former person that we knew and know well, and um, she just became very, very obsessive about dogs and just very unlike herself, because she, she normally had so many interests and so many, she, she was definitely grieving, and it was, it was quite concerning. For a long time, it scared me how amazing Gypsy was because I knew that no dog would ever be as good as her. And I've come to realize that I will never replace Gypsy. There's never going to be another Gypsy. And I wish there was. I wish she was still here, but she's not. And as hard as that is to face, that's a part of what you get into when you get a guide dog. Sitting in the front passenger seat of the family car, Molly travels anxiously back to Mira seven years later, this time with a grieving heavy heart. I am here at the Mira Foundation in Quebec to get my second guide dog. The trust that you have to have with a guide dog is huge because my life, or the life of a guide dog handler, is in those four paws. If, if they don't stop at the curb and they walk you out into the middle of the street, you can get hit by a car. I brought with me to Mira this time around a rock that I had painted when Gypsy passed away. And it has her face painted on it. And it says Gypsy in Braille. And I brought it because one, I want to be able to introduce 
my new dog to her. And two, because it helps me to feel like she's watching out for me while I'm here. And I also brought a necklace, a very special necklace to me. It's made of dog bones and it has two angel wings and a heart and a peace sign. And I've worn that necklace almost every day since she passed away. It's my gypsy necklace and it makes me think of her. It makes me feel like I have a piece of her with me. It was hard on her in the sense that her heart was a little closed at first because she still had a lot of strong love and compassion uh, for her other guide dog that passed away. As Molly settles in for her first night at Mira, she sends her family a quick goodnight text, then turns out the light. Coming up on AMI Originals presents a new friend in sight. My main thing would be that she wouldn't get through the training process because she was quite fragile emotionally and physically. Welcome back to AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. It's early morning. The sun is rising. The process of matching a guide dog with its ideal handler is so sensitive that our cameras are not allowed to film Molly's first few days at Mira for fear of disrupting the delicate process. Karen Winter, a veteran trainer at Mira, explains. The way it works at Mira is we'll try several dogs with a person initially and see what the feeling is between the two. They have to have a certain symbiose that develops within them. Sometimes it just doesn't click together, um, in which case we could change the dog at any time, but we have to see that they have that symbiose together, that, that chemical connection. The matching process is very special. We have to look at the personality of the person, and match it to a per the personality of the dog. We have to look at the natural speed of the person and match to a natural speed, the same natural speed to the dog. It is absolutely true that I've seen incredible things, like on the first day, we have people sitting in the kennel, all the dogs are there in their pens, they're happy. One comes out curious, it's a Labrador or some other race. He goes to see a woman or a man, sits down there, and we decide, well, let's try him just for fun. And it works, it works. When a visually impaired person comes to Mira, they will stay for a period of four weeks if they've never had a guide dog before. And in the beginning, they have to learn the site here at Mira, how to travel on the site so that when they do get their dog, they know where to command the dog to go, whether it be forward, left or right. If you have a person uh, working and living in a downtown environment, you have to have a dog that's almost perfect, doesn't have any fears whatsoever, and uh, enjoys living in that type of busy, noisy environment. If somebody comes here and thinks the dog is going to do everything for them, it won't work. If that person arrives here and in their head, well, it becomes like in the army, if there is no feeling in the contact, there is no feeling of warmth, well, I could give them the best dog in the world, it's not going to work. Mistral, a gentle but spunky Saint-Pierre, has been matched up with Molly. We catch up with them a few days into their training. The first few days at Mira, I worked with a dog named Mistral, who was a Saint-Pierre. He was this short, little, long-haired teddy bear of a dog. He had an amazing walking speed, and I loved that he reminded me nothing of Gypsy, because it made it easier to push all those sad and angry emotions about her death away and feel like it was a totally fresh start. I see. Okay, look. As the training progresses, things are not going well. Interior. Allez. Interior. Mistral and I, um, we weren't gelling. So he kind of looked at me and was like, you know, I don't, I don't love you. I don't connect with you, so I don't really want to listen to you. 
And it was one of those things where he knew how to guide. He's a good, he's a good dog and he knows his job. But because he didn't love me, he didn't respect me, he didn't care what command I was giving him. And so even though I could continue to correct him, continue to redo things, when you're not gonna make that connection, he's not gonna do the work he's meant to do. I couldn't feel safe with him guiding me because our trust uh, as a working team wasn't there. And when I realized that that dog wasn't meant for me and it wasn't meant to be, and I went back to the kennel and received Gallop, I just cried and cried and cried for an entire morning. And I just wanted to give up and go home. Because every time I put my hand on Gallop, who is a tall, strong, short-haired Labernese, just like Gypsy was, it felt like I was touching her, but it, it wasn't. She wasn't there. And it just brought up all of that pain of losing her. My main thing would be that she wouldn't get through the training process because she was quite fragile emotionally and physically after Gypsy passing away. So would her health hold up? That was major. My big goal, week one, was to find a dog that was nothing like Gypsy. And I did that and it didn't work. I used to call Gypsy my really long left arm. <laughs> she was just my left side. She was always there. Um, that, was, that was her spot. And she became a piece of me. When Molly was feeling really sensitive because she had lost her, her previous dog and was finding it hard to bond with, uh, with Gallup, um, I tried to show her how good Gallup was as a dog. So we went to a couple of different places and she saw how well he was. We went into some stores and uh, she didn't have any difficulty with her dog. He went in, he was calm, laid down when we were talking and I was showing Molly things. And it helped Molly to see that, hey, open your heart, this guy's really good too. You have enough love in your heart for both. All you know is that first dog. And you're not going to get your first dog back. Right, G. In a busy Montreal urban park, Molly and Gallup team up for the first time away from the controlled environment of Mira's training facility. Karen Winter follows with a watchful eye. Sit down. Anava. Ale. Suddenly, Gallup is distracted. This is something he's been doing, is this random bolting. Our producer steps in to investigate the cause. She had another dog, yes. and it didn't work out. It didn't click together. So she has this dog now. But he's so pretty she new. Skipped, uh, he's yeah. still new. Yeah. So she skipped that exercise, so it hasn't been reinforced yet, and that's why the dog took it upon himself to go and see if he could win picking up that piece of bread. So that's why I had to stop him right there and show him no. Even though you're not working with a trainer, you still can't do that, and it's on the to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> to do that exercise yeah. in a controlled environment. Gallop rest. Soon after, Molly and Gallop are confronted by a large Hop moving up. maintenance van consuming the Hop pedestrian up. path. Way. Bon Should I step up here? No. Okay. Molly Pass. and Gallop bon wait by the curb. And you can turn to the left. Ah. Prest. En avant. Bon chien. Again, our observation leads to some questions for Molly. I noticed the, the commands are in French. How did, how, I mean, you're, you're English, Molly. How's your French coming along? How's that fit into? Was, your, was, was Gypsy, were the commands with Gypsy in French? Or were they in English? All of my commands with Gypsy were in French. And prior to getting Gypsy, I didn't know any French because in school I was exempt from French so I could learn Braille. So I came to Mira my first time at 13 knowing absolutely no French, and they taught me all of the commands, all of the trainers knew some English, and I had no problems. And now I, I know all the commands, and I actually prefer having a dog that knows French commands, because then when I'm in an English environment, other people can't command him. He doesn't know what they're saying. 
We had one of these near my apartment in Toronto, and there was a big greenhouse. After a draining day of training, the team loads up into a van and heads back to Mira, a one-hour drive into the peaceful country. Back at Mira, Molly describes her routine. Usually after a day of training, I just head to my room, get the dog some water, probably change into something more comfortable. Um, and then I'll usually just go hang out in the common area and wait for dinner. Today is Monday and I got Gal up on Friday morning. So I've only had two full days of training and one half day. That's it. Things with Gallup are going really well. He's a huge sweetheart. He's 90 pounds, so he's bigger than me. Um, weighs more than I do because I'm really petite. But he, uh, he, it can be intimidating at first. But when you get to know him, he is like, the most zen dog. I have a couple nicknames. I call him Mr. Zen, Buddha Boy, because he's just like this totally calm dog. Today was a really good day. Uh, it was very hot out, but we went to Montreal, downtown Montreal, um, all piled in this big car together, and went to a park, which was really nice. And we did routes to make sure the dogs weren't distracted by the squirrels and other dogs and didn't want to sniff the grass. And there was like tennis courts. So making sure the dog's not distracted by the ball going back and forth. And there's so many different distractions for them, ponds with water. And, and so it was a neat experience because you get to see what your dog's really like in an everyday environment. The first week of class, of course, it's the matching period. Um, you have to show the dog that the same rules apply with the, the new master as it did with the trainer. Part of training is bonding and learning to trust each other. And so I'm learning to trust him, to know that he, he does his job and he's going to keep me safe in these environments. And he's learning that he needs to listen to me and that I'm his master, I'm his owner. Um, but that also, if he thinks I'm making a mistake, you know, it's intelligent disobedience, that he's not going to cross the street when I say so if he sees a car coming. So you have to show the dog that they have to work for you in the proper manner, and you will get rewarded the same as a trainer will do. You will get petted. You will get shown that thank you so much for working for me, petting, loving, uh, sometimes food rewards even. Coming up on AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. I dealt with construction issues all the time and I, I know I felt much safer doing it with Gypsy. Welcome back to AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. All right, buddy. Come here. He's so much stronger than I am. Back in her dorm room, Molly and Gallup relax and begin the bonding process over a game of tug of war. My goal week two was to work on connecting and bonding with my dog. Work on our communication and learning each other. In week two, we do a lot of uh, traveling in the neighboring towns. So the person gets more experience with the new dog on actual routes with street traffic and sees how the dog uses his, uh, his brain to, to get around and go around the obstacles. It's a windy, hot day. Molly, a trainer, and fellow guide dog handler go out with their new dogs to practice what they have learned. A building under construction has caution tape at shoulder level, blocking the sidewalk. Okay, so we have a, a barrier here. Great. So what are we going to do? We could go back and cross over to the other side of the street. We could. Um, or you could, except for the fact that back there it's an uncontrolled crossing. Oh. There's no, there aren't any stop any st signs. Nothing. Yeah. Okay. So the only option I have is to wait for assistance. That's right, wait for assistance. Because you don't want to go out into the street. Uh, there's, uh, because of the construction, you don't know how far out into Press. the street it's going to go. So we would ask a construction worker to help us at this point. But you're lucky. <laughs> Take my arm and follow me. Should I stay here and wait? Yeah. 
When I was living downtown Toronto in an apartment on my own, uh, we had construction for a good six months on the main intersection and the sidewalks where I lived. So I dealt with construction issues all the time and I, I know I felt much safer doing it with Gypsy. The challenge of getting a new guide dog is one, realizing that no, it's not your old dog, even if it kind of seems like it sometimes. And two, that those habits that you got into with your old dog after working it for five, eight, ten years, he doesn't know those things. The number one thing is safety. So they always have to know how the street crossings are controlled, whether it's with stop signs or with lights. And then when they did get to the lighted intersections, uh, some of them were complex lights with uh, priority left turn, so they had to stop and analyze that, decide which parallel traffic to go with. So it was, it was tough, and it's a hot day too, so uh, it runs on your patience. Yeah, but they did a wonderful job. All of their analyzing was perfect, 100%, nice straight crossings, good obstacle work. They did a good job today. Some of the challenges with working your second guide dog is that you've developed habits with your old guide dog. And many, many guide dog users have told me, and even some of my classmates here, that the second is the hardest because you've never transitioned before. It's early morning and the team is greeted by heavy rain. A good day to head into the city and take on a hectic subway system. Once they arrive, Nicolas Saint-Pierre organizes the handlers into small teams before sending them off into the metro. So big goals for uh, week three and week four, much longer routes, possibly even in areas that they've never worked in before. Of course, they have memorized the route beforehand. Um, if a person does subway travel as well, we'll work on that. We did get some phone calls where she was definitely feeling very, very challenged. And at one point we thought, that's it, we're, we're gonna go up and get her. And then an hour later, we phoned just to confirm, told her times we could come. And by then she said, it's okay, I'm going to give this a shot. I think I'm going to be okay. Riding in a busy subway car, trainer Karen Winter, along with Molly and Gallup, and a fellow handler with his dog, all prepare for their first stop. The subway doors open and the platform quickly fills with rushing passengers in all directions. The team navigates the human maze and heads for the safety of a nearby wall. And in weeks uh, three and four, the team fully comes together. The bonding process is uh, going to a much higher level at that point, much deeper. Standing at the edge of a subway platform, trainer Karen Winter attempts to coax a guide dog to move her dangerously between two exterior subway cars. The dog refuses and guides his handler safely inside one of the cars. Okay, we're not going to go to the same place. We're going to go one stop more, so... Three stops? Three stops. Yeah. Three stops. We get off at the third stop. Okay. Next, the team heads for a busy escalator. Both Molly and fellow handler get on the escalator without a glitch. 
They, they, they don't decipher which way they're going. After they're experienced, doing it a lot of times, maybe then they can, but at this stage in their training, no, they don't know the difference. Okay. Escalators were always a challenge with Gypsy. It was one of those things that made her really uncomfortable. Tail would go between the legs, she'd be panicking to try to get off. So I'm not used to having a dog that's so smooth and just gets on, stays till the very end and walks off. So I'm really happy with him in escalators. It's, it's nice because with Gypsy, I'd always try to find stairs or an elevator. Oui, monsieur, bon chien. Oui, monsieur, bon chien. Good boy. Karen Winter works with Gallup, trying to get him to take her near the edge of the subway platform without a train. Gallup refuses. Now it's Molly's turn. Again, Gallup refuses. As a, an experienced trainer, you can see how the dog is feeling with that person. You can see how that person is feeling with that dog. How it goes, is it smooth, is it rough? The team heads above ground to travel the chaotic downtown Montreal streets. Audible and physical distractions are everywhere, such as this out-of-place piano and performer. The challenges are seemingly endless, and the guide dogs have to adapt on the fly when it comes to changing sidewalk textures, contrast, and color. So there was no contrast, no contrast, no color contrast, so he didn't uh, understand. Gallup's doing a really good job today. We're having a really good day together. Um, he's navigating really well. We've had a few little problems with finding curbs on the sidewalk because the sidewalks aren't painted. Gallup, no. So we just went over that a couple times with him, and then he picked it up right away, so he's doing well. There are countless rules that handlers and guide dogs have to know and follow, especially when crossing chaotic downtown Montreal streets. Why don't you pass in front? Gallup carefully maneuvers Molly around a large street pole, then stops her gracefully at the corner of a busy intersection. Something that is incredibly important for a guide dog in harness is to not distract it. Don't pet it, don't look it in the eyes, don't talk to it, don't make cute faces at it, pretend it's not there. And I know it's hard, but ultimately, my life is in those four pods. And if my dog gets distracted, that can be incredibly dangerous. Coming up on AMI Originals presents a new friend in sight. In the future, they're just going to look for that person looking, oh, what a beautiful dog with the big smile on their face. And they're going to say, yes, yes, pet me. But no, you can't have that. Welcome back to AMI Originals presents a new friend in sight. The team travels the chaotic downtown Montreal streets. It's important that the dog always understands the difference of I'm on harness, I'm working, and I have a job. And I'm off harness, I can play with people, I'm a regular dog. So if somebody comes up and starts petting the dog, it, it's a dog. They love to be petted. You know, so they're gonna, in the future, they're just gonna look for that person looking, oh, what a beautiful dog with the big smile on their face. And they're gonna say, yes, yes, pet me. But no, you can't have that. You're working, you have to concentrate, you have to be safe, keep your master safe. And when we're all done, then you can have your free time, your play time. Up, 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 up. Now, if I notice that something just isn't right, uh, I jump in there and I, I show, I would show Molly, no, you should be doing it this way and this is the reason why. This is what your dog is doing. This is why he's doing it. And this is what you have to do to solve that problem. Today we did some walking down 
the busy streets of Montreal, um, which can be intimidating. But as the day moves forward, there are still a few bumps in the road. Gallop. Gallop accidentally walks Molly too close to a protruding advertising panel. It makes contact with her shoulder. The past few days, we've been doing more real life situations, being in malls and subways on busy Montreal streets, um, right downtown. And so it's very real life for me because that's the kind of stuff that I do. So feeling him in this environment and seeing how confident he is and his speed is improving, he's getting faster, he's knowing more and more what I want. So I'd say these past few days have been really good for us together. And it's, uh, it's going really well and I'm really happy with him. And with my big beast by my side, Gallup, um, I felt completely safe and completely confident getting to the street corners, crossing the streets, making my way through big crowds. And, and uh, it was nice to know that I can feel safe with him because with Mistral, that was an issue. I, I just didn't feel safe. I didn't feel like I trusted him enough. For the final week of training, I want to soak up every bit of information I can from the trainers. Uh, it's, it's nice to go sometimes for a pleasure walk, you know, get away from all the traffic and the noise and just go for a nice, easy, peaceful walk once in a while. It's good for you, it's good for the dogs. Make sure I'm feeling ready and confident to return back to my environment, back to my family, back to my job, my life, with a new partner. Back at Mira, Instructor Karen Winter offers Molly an interesting piece of information. I just want to tell you one thing, Molly. Mm -hmm. The cage right behind you, that's where his home used to be. So that's why he's guiding you towards his home and then he clicks in. Right. Oh, I don't live there anymore. Aww. I'm with Molly in the house now. <laughs> so he like went there and then was like, nope, just kidding, going to the door. Exactly. Once a client has successfully completed their class, then they go home and a trainer will go and visit them sometime within the first month that they get home to make sure that the dog is settling in well in the new home environment, in, in, on their new routes that they have to do. Sometimes some things can be a little complicated, a little on the complex side. The dog is unsure, the person is unsure. So it's important to have the trainer uh, go and do a domicile visit to make sure that everything's running smooth. Three or four months from now, I'm hoping that Gallup and I are working as a smooth team that we were able to overcome obstacles that may have come in our way with the transition home and that we continue to bond and love each other. Coming up on AMI Originals presents A New Friend in Sight. It was also scary because you now had to take all of these skills you learned or were retrained on and bring them back to a real life situation. And you didn't have a trainer there to point out when the dog was making a mistake or to say what kind of correction you should use. Or you had to take what you learned and, and use it for yourself. And so that was a pretty daunting idea for me. Welcome back to AMI Originals Presents, A New Friend in Sight. It's been three months since our cameras left Molly behind, preparing for her final week of training with Gallup. Now, back at home, we catch up with Molly once again. The last week of training was really good. I got to leave after just three weeks instead of having to stay the whole four because the trainers felt that Gallup and I were ready to go home, so that was really nice. I definitely felt ready. I felt like I had learned everything they could teach me. I think for a first time guide dog user, four weeks of training is what's needed. She's at her goal, the one that I would have visualized for her, where she's, um, she's now on her second dog, like she's gone through the experience of the first, she's gone through the teenage years, she's had a really, really tough go of it, and that has just prepared her more for being an adult. So she's 
really and truly entering adulthood and there's more gray in her life and less black and white. Getting ready to head home from three weeks of intense training is or was very exciting, but it was also scary. I was excited to go home um, and see my friends and my family and get back to regular life, but it was also scary because you now had to take all of these skills you learned or were retrained on and bring them back to a real life situation. And you didn't have a trainer there to point out when the dog was making a mistake or to say what kind of correction you should use. Or you had to take what you learned and, and use it for yourself. Molly not only returned with Gallup, she also returned with a new sense of self. I think she's kind of advanced her growth beyond a lot of young adults her age. And um, I think she has so much to give and she's just been so creative in her her new business and it's just incredible to watch her just flowering and blossoming and and having a great relationship with a boyfriend and having fun with with other people her age. My initial reaction in, 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 in seeing Gallup was that boy he's big. <laughs> he's a big dog. Um, but again you could already see the change in Molly. That um, you could start to see the happiness and the joy come back into her. Um, just having that connection with the, with the dog again. Um, and I remember thinking very early on, I, I wasn't sure how, how she was going to deal with a new dog so soon after losing Gypsy. Um, but it was remarkable to see that, that again, the comfort level um, he was giving her and the support he gave her. Um, and he, I remember her remarking that he was actually a better guide dog than Gypsy was at the same stage. I believe that Molly's going to have a, a great time with her new dog, with Gallup. Uh, they're going to they're gonna fly sky high. I think so many great adventures. I think the sky's the limit. I think they have so much to, to offer and to share with other people. And I think the world is, is really, it's a great time for somebody like Molly, for young people where they can maybe have their own business and there's so much support for it, where they're, they're unique and different and I think the world wants to know more about that. You know, we're ready for, to hear more about the, the uniqueness in people. We'd always sort of said to her that mm -hmm. no matter what dog you get, you're going to find a part of Gypsy in her. So that you'll, there'll be something about the dog that will just remind you, because Gypsy hasn't left you. you know, she's still going to be there and you're going to see that part of her. And I think she did find that she with Gallon. Yeah. Well, what, what I said to her was, oh my gosh, Molly, you're back. Literally, it just felt like she had just come back. I want people to treat me like they would treat anybody else. I don't want special treatment because I'm the blind girl with the dog. Treat me like you would anyone else because ultimately I'm just an average 20 year old girl. Producer, director, writer, Dan Forbes. Narrator, Cam Drynan. Videographer, Jim Devlin, Darcy Detoni. Editor, Darcy Detoni. DV producer, Emily Harding. Unit manager, Karen McGee. Production supervisor, Janice Civitilli. Audio post, Mark Bialkowski. Graphics, Mike Smith. Special thanks, Molly Burke. Neve Burke, Peter Burke, Karen Winter, Mira Senior Trainer, Nicholas St. Pierre, Mira Director General, Lynn St. Amour, Mira Public Relations, Lole Store, Oakville, Ontario, the Mira Foundation and all of the staff and students, Bell Media and me to we Executive Producer, Andrew Morris, Executive in Charge of Production, Karen Nye, Director Programming, AMI-TV, Brian Perdue, Vice President Programming and Production, John Melville. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2015, Accessible Media Incorporated.